You've written this book, The Fall of the U.S. Empire, and then what? Um, U.S. fascism or U.S. blossoming. So what does that mean, and where do you think we're headed, U.S. fascism or U.S. blossoming? Could be both. My formula right now is U.S. fascism from the top and U.S. blossoming from the bottom. There is nothing so genuine, best positive Americans as the Occupy movement. Leaderless, nonviolent, dialogical, horizontal, equitable, enormously innovative in its mobilization. Now, when we look at nonviolent movements, just before I come to US fascism, there are some stages they go through. So the first is consciousness formation, spreading it to others, and I mentioned 99 versus 1% as a brilliant formula. And like all good Americans, they operate like public relations firms, so you have to find a one-liner, a one that you can put into an ad and put some color on it and things of that kind. So they're good Americans also in that sense. It works. Point two, organization. To be leaderless is brilliant. They should be. Otherwise, we know who would try to capture the leaders. It's exactly the same as the 300 mothers at Plaza de Mayo in Buenos Aires did. They had no leader. So when the Norwegian Nobel Peace Prize Committee should hand out the peace prize, they couldn't find any mother to give it to, so they gave it to a man instead. Shame on them. Uh, they also said that we cannot pay a ticket for 300 mothers to come to Norway for the ceremony. There are, there, are more, there are more creative ways of solving that. Putting a photo of them on the chair, for instance. Now, having said that, point three, a confrontation. Well selected. Amy, I pay attention to, what a shame. I haven't seen President Obama come out a single time sitting down with them dialoguing. With? President Obama, I haven't seen it. Sitting down with? With the occupiers. I haven't seen him doing what Bob McNamara did and writes about in the book in retrospect, very touchingly. That, you know, the students came, the anti-Vietnam War movement, outside his office, he was a workaholic. So they knew that the only window where there was light at 10 o'clock in the evening would be Bob. So they were down there and they were making their speeches and things of that kind. And then he decided to get out to talk some sense into them. You should read those pages. They talked sense into him. It's very touching. Now, why didn't he do something the day after? It's not that easy when you have that position. Give him some time. He did it. He was hated by Washington. You can say he took a risk by meeting them. Obama doesn't take that risk. He's a coward. So the confrontation would be for 10,000 occupiers to circle the White House and just say, Mr. President, come out. Just want to have a dialogue. Then comes the positive aspect, and that's when you struggle by doing things. They haven't come to that stage yet. So um, when I'm talking with them, they say, interesting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but Johan, we are not going to take your ideas. We're going to develop them ourselves. And uh, with a bit of good luck, I'll find some version of something I've said. But you see, it's not a question now of copyright or things of that type. A question of stimulating. But I would think in terms of agricultural cooperatives with sales points, growing food in an organic way, a green way, all over the US, invigorating the countryside, cooperative, less vulnerable to the ups and downs, selling food that is healthy at much lower prices. There would be sufficient amount of forces fighting them. If you do it many times, 10,000 of those, and you have made it. I would argue in favor of local savings banks, or boycotting the hedge funds. Girl cutting, as they say, the small savings banks. And they would even say that maybe you could learn from the Muslims, 
from the Sharia, where the law is never lend out more than 30% of your capital. Uh, the US limit was 2,400. <clears throat> that Bush found too limiting. After that, the sky has been the limit. And when you come tumbling down from the sky, you tumble quite deep at accelerating speed. And the third idea is an idea that I have as a um, professor, as an older professor. You want to beat the tuition fees? Mobilize retired professors to teach the courses for almost nothing. They can draw on their spare pension funds. Get rid of the administrators by administering it together with the students. Make 1,000 of them and you have one. For the retired professors, it would be a blessing because retired means to be tired again and again and again. That's why it's called retired, you see. So, as you may guess from me, <clears throat> I am not retired and I'm not tired. <laughs> so, to my colleagues in the room, for heaven's sake, don't retire. <laughs> But offer those courses. It will be a blessing to the retired professors. What do we have that freshly minted PhDs don't have? Okay, young PhD, prepare yourself. First of all, we have experience. Second, we have the higher level of knowledge called wisdom. It comes with white hair. I see in the room some, of pe some people qualify, thank you. Others are on the way, thank you. Thank you. So you see, there's hope for the future. <laughs>